So I'm really excited for this webinar because I think that becoming an effective rider is something that we all struggle with, whether we're first just learning how to ride or whether you're a more advanced rider and you're working on the upper level movements, you're always trying to refine your aids and become more effective and more subtle and more elegant. That's the hard part is that in dressage, we want invisible aids and we want to have harmony with our horse. And it's not just about being forceful and like using really overt aids to be effective. So I wanted to start out with a little story that I had for you guys. Um, and I want you also to think about like, what's a moment that you've had where you feel just incredibly ineffective as a rider? Um, for me, I remember there was a moment, I have a horse named Geronimo and he had a horrible rearing problem. So for a while, I didn't do dressage with him. I just did natural horsemanship stuff. And that was great. We like went to cows and we rode out and we, you know, just learned how to ride him. Um, but when I came back and started doing dressage again, I started taking some dressage lessons from a really good trainer, Sue Hales, who many of you I'm sure know. And I remember just feeling like I was pulling so much on him and I just had so much pressure in the hand and I was trying to get him on the bit and he got really frustrated and I was really frustrated and I felt just totally ineffective because I wasn't communicating well with him. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing when we're talking about being an effective rider is that we have to find ways to better communicate to our horses exactly what it is that we want. Um, horses, in my opinion, are incredibly generous and honest, and they are not likely to just want to like blow you off or ignore you or be naughty. I don't believe that horses are that way. They're not mean, they're not out to get you, so if they're not doing what you want, it's probably because you're not communicating well with them. Um, so, what's on the agenda today? Um, we're going to start with what is an effective rider and kind of try and define that. Then we're gonna talk about dressage rider position because that is huge. If you want to be an effective rider, your position has to be correct. We're going to talk about the dressage training scale. We're going to talk about horsemanship because I think I actually have a background in natural horsemanship and understanding how horses think and how to communicate them with them is a big part of being an effective rider. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the two courses that I have for sale right now because those are really good courses. and. I'm going to hopefully leave you guys inspired and educated about how to be an effective rider. So let's get started with this. So what is an effective dressage rider? That is the question that we are starting with. And there's two pictures here. So on the left, we see a not so nice picture. And on the right is Catherine Dufour. She's one of my all-time favorite most inspiring riders to watch she's a danish rider she's young and she is just so beautiful to watch so harmonious with her horse and i just love watching her ride so um what makes an effective rider clearly both of these riders are having an effect on the horse um, the rider on the left you can see has her horse curled behind the vertical the horse's tail is kind of up. Um, it's not the prettiest picture. The rider on the right, obviously the horse looks much happier. The horse's tail, um, Catherine Dufour's horse, the tail is hanging down nicely. The horse looks relaxed. Um, also notice the gait. So on the left, it's a little hard to tell. It looks like the horse is trotting, but the horse really doesn't look comfortable. Um, it doesn't look like an honest trot, like even the rhythm of the trot looks a little bit sketchy in that photo. Um, 
also look at the rider's positions. So the rider on the left is not in the correct position. She's sitting too far back. Um, she's clearly pulling a lot on the reins and she's causing the horse to curl behind the vertical. So she's having an effect on the horse, absolutely, but it's not really the desired effect that we want. Um, versus the rider on the right, you know, the horse looks happy and peaceful and willing to do his job. And that's so important in dressage is that we are creating a willing, harmonious partner. Um, so, I asked some people on, uh, on my Facebook group, Amelia's Dressage Club, what makes an effective rider? And we had some good answers. So clear, subtle aids. Um, someone said soft but firm, which is true because there's moments that you have to be really soft, but there's also moments that you need to be really firm and um, making a correction. Um, Vicky said, one that is able to convey to the horse what is required. So that's a huge thing too, is that we need to be able to um, communicate to the horse what we want. And like I said before, horses are really willing animals. So um, it's, it's never like they are, don't want to do what you want. You have to communicate it better. Do you guys have, if you guys have any other input, feel free to comment and let me know, you know, what, what in your mind is an effective rider? What does an effective rider look like? Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So this, it's always interesting sometimes to go back and think about like, what is the object of dressage? What are the general principles of dressage? This I got um, off of the FEI website. So the object of dressage is the development of the horse into a happy athlete through harmonious education. As a result, it makes the horse calm, supple, loose, and flexible, but also confident, attentive, and keen, thus achieving perfect understanding with the athlete. So that right there is kind of defining to you um, the definition of an effective dressage rider is that you have this amazing communication and harmony with your horse. Um, these qualities are demonstrated by freedom and regularity of the paces, harmony and lightness and ease of movements, lightness of the forehand and engagement of the hindquarters originating from a lively impulsion, acceptance of the bit with submissiveness and throughness without any tension or resistance. The horse thus gives the impression of doing of its own accord what is required, confident and attentive, submitting generously to the control of the athlete, remaining absolutely straight in any movement on a straight line and bending accordingly when moving on curved lines. So I think we've all seen an unhappy dressage horse. You know, a horse that looks like it is being forced into doing the work. Um, and that's not what we want. We want a horse who's willing and happy and understanding of what we want. And Dottie asked in the chats, is this the FEI definition? Yes, this I got off of the FEI website. And that's a great resource. They have like all of the rules, they have a lot um, on there that's a great resource for you guys. Okay, next slide. Dressage rider position is huge in being an effective rider. So if you guys want answer in the chat here, which aspect of your riding position do you most struggle with? Seat, legs, hands, symmetry, Symmetry has to do with evenness, like how even you are left and right. And alignment has to do with that ear, shoulder, hip, heel line that we talked about. So let's see, seat, legs, hands, seat from a sore lower back, hands and symmetry, legs, symmetry, elbows and hands, 
alignment. Okay, so it's great to hear from all of you. Um, someone says a wiggly lower leg. Uh, straight elbows and lengthen leg, all of it. Okay, so I love hearing from all of you guys because, um, you know, we all struggle with our position. We all have asymmetries and weaknesses and things we need to work on and make better. No rider, even the top rider, even Charlotte Dujardin, there's issues that we all have in our riding position that we need to work on and make better. And being in the correct position is what allows us to affect our horses. Um, so, let's see, next slide here. Only a rider in the correct position can make the correct aids. So if you think back to that first slide I showed of the, the two effective riders, but one was a really ugly picture and one was a beautiful picture, the rider on the right had a lovely position and was in the correct position, and that's what allowed her to affect the horse in a good way. So I like to think of three lines that help get you in the correct position. So the first line there on the left um, is from your ear, shoulder, hip, and heel. So it's really important that you keep this alignment in order to be able to properly affect your horse. If, for example, you're leaning forward, your seat won't be effective, you won't have effective half halts, and if you lean forward, often your lower leg goes too far back in the horse's flank. This is what I do. My tendency is to lean forward and my lower leg um, goes too far back. Now, the second line that's really important is the line from your elbow to the horse's mouth. You should try and think about like, imagine like your forearms are super long and that you could actually hold the bit with your, with your hand. So like if your forearm grew to be three feet long and you could grab onto the bit and ride your horse that way, that's how straight that line needs to be. Some of the common mistakes that I see are one of the biggest ones is I see riders that ride with a straight arm. I know someone in the chat earlier mentioned that they do that. When your arm is straight, um, it creates a lot of stiffness and um, it's impossible to be supple and give your horse the supple contact to the bit. Another common mistake I see, which actually in this picture here, you see that my hands are too high. So if your hands are too high, again, that breaks the straight line from elbow to mouth, and it's gonna cause a little bit of stiffness in the connection. Um, Sarah says, I'm short, so when I'm told to put my hands forward, then my arms go straight. Yeah, so your arms shouldn't be straight. You should have a forward feeling hand, but you always need to have a little bit of a bend in your elbows. Um, and like Marette says, your elbows need to a little bit follow the motion of the horse's head and neck. So in the walk in the canter, the horse's head bobs up and down and your elbows are a little bit straightening and bending with that motion. Now, one of the other common mistakes I see riders make is they use an indirect rein aid. So a lot of times you guys try and neck rein your horse. <laughs> I know many of you are guilty of this. I'm guilty of this. Often if your horse doesn't get off the leg, instead of using your leg to move them over, we try to take the rein across the horse's neck and get them to move over. And again, this is breaking that straight line from elbow to mouth. If your arms were really long, you couldn't take your arm across the horse's neck. So that's line number two. Line number three is a line that goes down the middle of your spine and it should align with the horse's spine. So your spine should be perpendicular directly above the horse's spine. If your spine is to the left or to the right of the horse's spine, 
or if your spine has a curve in it, like if either you collapse left or collapse right, that's going to screw up your position and your aids are not going to be as effective. Okay, let's move on. So let's talk about the aids. The aids are what we use to influence our horse, to have an effect on our horse. So we have three sets of aids and also the voice, which I didn't include, but that's another important aid. So the legs, your legs are the driving aid. Your legs get your horse to go forward. Your hands and your arms are the restraining aid. So your, your hands get the horse to go on the bit, they get the horse to slow down in a very simple way. And then your seat is the translator between the driving aids and the restraining aids. So the main job of your seat is simply to follow and absorb the motion of the horse's back. It's really important um, that your seat is absorbing the motion of the horse's back and that there's no disconnect between your butt and the saddle. So if you find yourself slapping into the saddle or if you see lots of daylight between your bum and the saddle, then your seat is not acting as a very good translator. Now, the, you don't actually do a lot of aids only from your seat. I know we all hear over and over again like, oh, I need to get where I'm riding more from my seat. But driving with your seat to get your horse to go is not effective. Um, I don't know, I've seen people that are like shoving at the horse from the seat and that does not get your horse to go. Um, your seat can a little bit support your half halt. So like tightening your lower abs and a little bit holding in your back um, can help to slow the horse a little bit down and half halt the horse. Um, but your seat should not be a driving aid. That's the job of your leg. Um, you can a little bit too with your seat. Sometimes you weight one seat bone more than the other. For example, in a turn or for a canter, you a little bit have more weight on your inside seat bone. It's a little bit, so it's not like you're keeling over to the side. It's just like you kind of put a little more weight in one seat bone or the other. Um, but make sure that you don't collapse your upper body. So those three lines that we talked about in the previous slide, those lines have to stay straight when you're using your aids. Um, so let's see, we have some comments here. Lynn says, do short riders like me need a different technique to achieve a good position? So no. Um, the, the basic riding position is the same whether you're tall or short. Um, short riders, you know, you may need to use your legs a little differently. When you're shorter, you don't have quite as much height for as much leverage, but it's the same three lines, it's the same aids, everything is still the same. Um, Linda says, sometimes I slam into the saddle mostly due to neglecting working out outside of riding. Thank you for mentioning that, Linda. I'm going to talk about the importance of fitness a little later on. And Dottie says, shoving with your seat forces the horse's back down. So yeah, absolutely. The horse's back is very sensitive. It's like a very sensitive area for them. That's why you know, saddle fit is so important. So if you're slapping in the saddle or if when you're posting, you don't land softly in their back, um, that's not going to be comfortable for them. So those are the three sets of aids and how you use them in coordination is what affects your horse. Next slide. Okay, driving aids and boiled frogs. So this is a great analogy to use. And basically what it is, is there's this myth, I don't know, I've never tried it. But if you put a frog in lukewarm water and you turn on the heat 
the frog will just stay in the water until the water boils and the frog dives. But if you drop a frog into boiling water, they'll jump right back out. And a lot of us riders, myself included, we boil our frogs. Our horses become boiled frogs. And the reason that this is, is that we tend to nag with our aids, with our driving aids especially. So the horse just comes to ignore them. It kind of starts out like we ask our horse to trot and let's say we put, you know, two ounces of pressure and the horse doesn't listen. So we put three ounces of pressure and the horse doesn't listen. So we put four ounces of pressure. Before we know it, the water's boiling. We're doing all that we can do with our driving aids and the horse is just sitting in the boiling water like, ah, life's good, man. I don't know what your problem is. So when you use your driving aids, oh, Marette says it's a myth. I don't know, we'll have to try. But the analogy still works. When you use your driving aids, you have to get your horse to jump out of the boiling water. So you start with a really light, soft whisper of an aid because that's always the goal is that you want your horse to react to a very small aid. So you start with a tiny aid and if your horse doesn't listen, then you go right up to the boiling water. So rather than increasing the water degree by degree by degree, you ask at the level that you want to respond, which let's say it's two ounces of pressure, and then you've got to boil the water and go up to an extreme aid. Now, when you go to that extreme aid, your horse may leap forward. They may canter off, even if you only wanted trotting. They may even, you know, buck or get a little excited, but that's what you want. You want to train your horse to jump away, not to be afraid, but that they need to react to your aid. So I hope that analogy um, is helpful to you guys. Let me know. I actually have a video that I did a long time ago about this, but um, it's really, you know, we do. We boil our, our horses into boiled frogs. And part of this comes from fear, I think because young horses and like wild horses are super, super sensitive and we don't wanna die or get bucked off. And so we a little bit numb our horses to our aids so that we feel safe. And then we're mad when they don't listen to us. So it's our fault. It's 100% the rider's fault. We've taken that sensitivity out of our horses. Um, but using this technique, you can put the sensitivity back into them. Okay, Dottie says, so you go from lukewarm water to boiling. Yes, you wanna go from like, if your aid is say lukewarm and then right up to boiling, you don't wanna ask, ask a little harder, ask a little harder, ask a little harder. You wanna ask nice and soft and then get the reaction even if it's more than you want. I wanted to talk a little bit about the rider position course that I have and you know, my goal with this lecture, with everything that I do for all of you guys, is of course that I want to help as many people as possible along on their riding journey. And I do a lot of free videos and free content and you can get a lot from this lecture and from everything that I give out on a weekly basis. Um, but the rider position course is a great course if you want to kind of fast track your riding position or if you feel like you're just really struggling with getting your body in the right position so that you can affect your horse. So this is a six week course um, and we work with Stephanie Schwelt. Many of you guys know Stephanie. Um, she's a physical therapist that's licensed by USEF and she specifically works with riders. So it's really important that you work on your body when you're not riding. So that you're stretching, that you're working on your asymmetries, that you're working on the ability to control your body and tell your leg to do one thing and your hand to do another thing when you're not on the horse. Um, so 
This is kind of just an outline of the course. So week one, we work on position basics. Week two, we focus on the seat. Week three, we focus on legs. So leg position, the effective leg, leg balance and coordination exercises, leg exercises. And then week four is hands, arms, and shoulders. And then week five is turns and lateral work. And week six is rider asymmetries. So the cool part about this course is it's kind of one piece of the course is focusing on teaching you how to use your body in the saddle. That's the part that I do. And then the second part of the course is focusing on Stephanie giving you specific exercises that you do when you're not riding to work on that specific aspect of your rider position. Um, Linda asks, is it mostly you teaching or Stephanie? So I do all of the teaching for the riding part of it, like for when I'm in the saddle and talking through how I use the different aspects of my position when I'm in the saddle. And Stephanie does all the unmounted exercises because Stephanie's a licensed physical therapist. So she talks you through exactly what muscles to be engaging. And she really helped me come up with the exercises to target each part of your position. And at the end of the course, you have, there's like a 15 or 20 minute full body exercise video that is specifically designed to help you with your position. So it's something that you can do, you know, before you ride to kind of activate all the right muscles for your riding. Okay, next slide. Um, eight points of rider straightness. So this concept, it, I actually comes from my other course on the dressage training scale. These are both really great courses. Um, and again, like I said, you don't have to take the course, but if you really want to, you know, stay motivated and make progress this summer, especially with COVID and everything being canceled, clinics and shows and everything else being canceled, these courses are a really great way to kind of dive deeper into your riding and focus on it. So I created this concept, eight points of rider straightness. Um, Many of you guys mentioned that straightness and symmetry is something you struggle with in your riding position. And believe it or not, we all struggle with straightness because we're all naturally a little bit crooked. So this is a good kind of schematic to figure out how to analyze your straightness in the saddle. So number one, we always start with our seat and our pelvis. The reason that you start with this is because that has the most contact with the horse. Like how you sit in the saddle is really your control center for how you influence the horse. So when you sit in the saddle, take note of this tomorrow. Do you feel both seat bones even? Um, are your seat bones pointing down into the saddle or are they pointing backwards or are they pointing forward? Your seat bones should be like pointing straight down. If you're leaning forward, your seat bones are gonna point back. If you are leaning back, your seat bones are gonna point forward. Now, the other thing is to make sure that your seat bones are level, like relative to the horse's shoulders. Make sure that you don't have, like some riders have a twisted pelvis where the left seat bone will be more forward and the right seat bone will be more back or the right seat bone will be more forward and the left seat bone will be more back. So you've got to get that even to start with. Then from there, you work down the legs. So how are your knees? Are both your knees behind the knee roll? Are they even? If you drew a line between your knees, is that line parallel to the ground? How are your ankles? Are your stirrups even? If someone looks at you from the front or takes a picture of you, are your ankle bones even on the horse? Your toes, are they pointing forward the same or does one toe point out and the other to toe point forward? My left toe points out and it drives me crazy, but this starts from my hip. My hip is tight and weak on the left side and that's why my left toe points out. And then 
from, we go back to the pelvis, and then you work your way from your shoulders. How are your shoulders? Again, are your shoulders even? Your head, do you cock your head to one side when you ride? Or I've seen riders do very strange things with their head. Do you look down? Um, your head is really heavy. So if you're doing funny things with your head, it's going to affect your position. If you're doing funny things with your head, it's gonna affect your pelvis, it's gonna affect your shoulders, it's gonna affect everything. And then your elbows and your hands. Um, again, your hands should be even. You should have even contact in both your reins. So those are kind of eight points of rider straightness. It's a lot to think about, but just kind of sit in the saddle tomorrow, try and kind of assess those eight points and feel them. And then as you're going, check in and say, you know, are those points even or is one of them really wonky? Okay, um, I can't read the title, but it has to do with fitness, rider fitness. Um, so many of you guys are on my Facebook group called Amelia's Dressage Club. If you're not, it's been so fun to like hear from you and see photos of your horses. I have so enjoyed it. But we had a, um, a member say that she's learning dressage. She's 47. Is she too old to learn dressage? And literally, we had a hundred comments of people just telling her like, no, you're not too old. I honestly think that she's younger than most people on this call, than most people um, that I teach. I have a student that is 80 and he like looks amazing on a horse. So that's the wonderful thing about dressage is you're not too old and you can keep getting better and making progress, but it is really important that you take care of your body and your fitness and your health. So how are you guys sitting in the chair right now? Are you collapsing to one side? Are you leaning on one seat bone or the other? Are you sitting up straight? Is your chest out? Are your shoulder blades pulled together? So how you sit at your computer, how you sit in your car, how you, if you always, how you stand. If you always stand with one leg weighted and one leg rested, if you stand even and square or are your hips cocked. All of this affects your riding. And if you don't do exercises to become aware of these asymmetries and to counteract them, it's going to have a negative effect on your riding. So as you get older, it's really important that you do things that take care of your body when you're not riding because it's not fair to your horse to get on your horse and say um, that you're gonna use riding to get yourself fit. That is, that's not okay. You need to take care of your body and get yourself fit so that when you get on your horse, you have control of your body. That's really important to being an effective rider. So the images there are images of Stephanie. Again, she's the physical therapist that helped me with the rider position course. The top image, she's showing us a shoulder stretch that helps counteract how we all slump forward at our desk and when we're driving. And on the bottom there, she's showing us an exercise to activate the glute med. And the glute med is a muscle in your glute, obviously that helps you to put your leg on the horse. And that's really important that you have control of your leg and that you can put your leg on your horse when you are riding. Um, okay, let's see what questions we have. Dottie says, back to frogs for the driving aids. Is it squeeze, pony kick, stick, or squeeze to stick? Just want to confirm. So in general, I would say squeeze, kick, and then whip. Um, because the whip is the auxiliary aid, you really want to avoid having to use that. But it depends on the horse. Um, if it's a really lazy horse, you might just squeeze and then kick if you feel like they're totally blowing off your leg. But then you want to go back and repeat it. So if you have to hit your horse to trot, you need to repeat the walk-trot transition 
several times within a short period of time. So I would say within one minute, you need to repeat that walk, trot, walk, trot until your horse trots just from your leg. Next slide. Okay, I love, I love this poem. I'm so excited to share it with you. So mindset of the dressage rider. This is a huge thing in being an effective rider. And I see it all the time. My students that have a good mindset are way more effective than my students that have a negative mindset. So negative emotions, um, you guys can help me out because I didn't put them all in here. So what, what negative emotions come into your head when you're riding? We all have them. I have them too. Fear, um, anger, frustration. Sometimes I think that fear causes anger, like because you're afraid, you're maybe angry at your horse. Let's see, Dorothy says impatience, Carolyn, anxiety, Linda, inadequate, Meryl, self-doubt, Michaela, hopelessness, Gail, not good enough, allowing my mind to go elsewhere, frustration, unconfident, self-doubt. So yeah, we all have those negative emotions. It's important that you recognize them, feel them, and then figure out how to channel them into something more productive that's gonna allow you to better communicate with your horse. So Lori posted this poem on my Facebook group and it like really touched me because I feel this way, I know you guys feel this way. The saddest thing I've ever seen is a woman on a horse that does not believe she's good enough to be there. Do not compare yourself. There's only this moment, this horse, your hand, seat, voice, and leg define the parameters of the entire world for this horse. What anyone else is doing or has ever done does not matter. Whomever it is that you look up to or feel less than is in turn looking up to another rider wishing to aspire to that level. So be content where you are. You are blessed. You are your only competition. Just be better today than you were yesterday. Try harder for this horse you ride and try harder for yourself. Most of all, enjoy this time, every moment, every stride, every cue that is answered with a response. Cherish this partnership. Know that you are exactly where you are supposed to be. Like this poem, it just gives me chills, like seriously, because I feel this way and you know, I know a lot of people look up to me and I still sometimes feel like, you know, I have like Harvey's a really special horse. He's super talented. Sometimes I feel like he would be so much better if Stefan Peters or Charlotte Dujardin or someone else was riding him. Um, but it's also really important how this poem points out that your horse looks up to you. And so you need to be confident in yourself and own your own emotions um, in order to give your horse confidence. So let's see, Rena says, since I'm not working with a trainer, I feel the judgment from others as I make my mistakes and try to figure things out. I can handle it most of the time with a sense of humor, but sometimes it gets to me and a few tears flow. <laughs> this journey is a real trip. Yes, I think we've all shed tears. Okay, let's move on to positive emotions. So you guys can help me out. What positive emotions are we going to use to replace our negative emotions? So confidence, that's a huge one. Um, being a leader to your horse. Andrea says gratitude. Carolyn says trust. Jessica says a sense of humor. Sarah says determination. Um, Claudia says happiness. Dorothy, better than yesterday. Love yourself, patience, pride in myself and my horse. That's a huge one. Just be proud of your horse. Faith, love your pony. Gail, what an opportunity. Reward your horse. Glow in my horse's eyes. 
Yeah, so I encourage all of you guys, you know, be proud. Like Linda says, I'm proud of my boy Asher. Asher. You'll be amazed how if you just change your attitude and what you're thinking, how it changes your horse. If you come to your ride with a positive outlook and um, being proud and grateful, you'll be amazed what your horse will give to you. Horses are really sensitive and they feel when you are frustrated or angry or you know don't have any confidence or that you don't deserve to be there. I just love that poem. Okay, I know you all love talking about half halts, so I'm going to talk about an effective half halt. So first of all, we've all discussed before, a half halt is kind of a gathering up an in, of energy. A half halt is what you do before you make a transition, before you make a flying change, uh, before you make a corner. It's kind of just, you know, checking in with your horse saying, hey, are you listening? And can I kind of bunch up the energy underneath my seat so that I can do something with it, whether it's to slow down, speed up, turn, whatever. A half halt is a balance between your seat, leg, and rein aids. So those aids that we talked about before all of those aids kind of come into play in a half halt. Now, every horse requires a different half halt. If your horse is lazy, the half halt is going to be more leg and seat. If your horse is hot and wants to really rush forward, it's going to be more rain. Um, the timing of your half halt is important. Uh, this image, I did a video a few weeks ago on the canter half halt, which you should all watch if you haven't yet. But when you half halt in the canter, you need to half halt on the upbeat of the canter. So in this photo here, Kensington, this is my five-year-old Kensington, he has a super canter. Um, his right hind leg is on the ground and his front feet are off the ground. You can see his mane is flying up. So that would be the moment in the canter when I half halt. Now, in order to make an effective half halt, I don't just half halt endlessly. I half halt in rhythm with the steps. So I would half halt up when his mane is flying up, up, up. I wouldn't just half halt and hold. So in order for your half halts to be effective, they need to be in the right timing that has to do with the gates. Um, how do you know if your half halt is effective? Sometimes you don't really know until you have a mistake. So let's say you're trotting and you want to canter and you say, okay, I need to half halt my horse. You do a few half halts, you ask for the canter, nothing happens. So then you need to go back and learn from why that half halt wasn't effective. Why wasn't that half halt effective? Probably because when you half halted, you took too much energy out of your horse. So next time when you half halt, it needs to be more of an energizing half halt in order to get your horse ready and to have the energy to pick up the canner. So that's just a little bit about how to be effective with your half halts. Okay, what else makes a rider effective? One thing that I think is really hard for many, for me especially, still today, but especially when I was first training my first Grand Prix horse, is not really understanding the system of dressage. Like, why does our horse need to be on the bit? Why are transitions so important? Um, how do you teach your horse to collect? What is a half pass and how, how do you get your horse to bend in the direction of travel? And the other thing that was really hard was understanding like, okay, I have a problem. Like my horse is rearing. Why is my horse rearing? What do I need to go back to in order to fix that? Why did my horse start rearing in the first place? That's Geronimo, you know, he started, he got a horrible rearing problem because I didn't know how to train a dressage horse and neither did the trainer I was working with. So it's really important to have a roadmap and a system 
that you implement in your daily training. And the dressage training scale is this system. It's really an amazing tool that applies to pretty much every horse and every rider, regardless of whether they're doing training level or whether they're a Grand Prix horse. So this is the training scale. The levels are, you start at the bottom. So pretty much every horse that I ride, I warm them up from the bottom to the top of the training scale. So I start with rhythm. I make sure I have a, the correct rhythm at the walk trot canter. Then I move up to suppleness. So suppleness has to do with relaxation and elasticity of the steps. Then I move up to connection, acceptance of the bit, acceptance of the aids, and then impulsion, straightness, and collection. So what's really cool is that if you understand the training scale, you'll start to see how all of the dressage movements and all of the dressage tests, the way that the tests are designed and the way that the, um, the judges judge you is based on the training scale. So at the bottom of the training scale here, exercises that work on rhythm and suppleness, mainly suppleness, are turn on the forehand, serpentines, leg yields, and groundwork. I, love doing groundwork with my horses. I think it's really important to get your horse to relax on the ground, to trust you starting on the ground, and to also start working on suppleness with your horse on the ground. These exercises are all exercises that I go over in detail in my dressage training scale course. So in that course, again, it's a six week program where I teach all of these exercises and how they all fit together into the dressage training scale and give you a structure and a framework for how to actually train your horse and how to have a destination and start to understand where you are heading towards. So connection is a lot about transitions. Connection is about the acceptance of the bit and acceptance of the leg. Impulsion. Impulsion is a tricky level because it's not just about running your horse faster. A lot of people, when they think of impulsion, they just think about um, going faster, like a racehorse. But a racehorse doesn't have impulsion. Impulsion has to do with the desire to move forward, the elasticity of the steps, the suppleness of the back. So impulsion is a complicated um, idea to understand. And then we have straightness. So a lot of people asked, why is straightness so far up on the training scale? Um, and this is an interesting question, but I think it's really important to understand. And I see a lot of people that they get on their horse and the first thing they try and work on is getting their horse straight before they have established rhythm or suppleness. So suppleness has to do with the elasticity of your horse. You have to stretch your horse and get to where you can move your horse before you just make them straight because you don't want your horse to be straight like a, you know, like a two by four or like this pin. You want your horse to be straight in a way that they can bend on a circle or bend for a half pass. So, I think that it's really important to consider that you focus on these lower levels, connection, acceptance of the bit, and acceptance of the leg, and also impulsion before you work on straightness. And going back to being an effective rider, you have to understand this system of dressage and what steps to take along the journey to get your horse to understand what you want but also to properly develop your horse physically so that they can do the upper level movements. So I hope that that gives you guys a little bit of light into the structure of dressage. And even if you're not ready for collection, even if you're just working at training level, it's really important to understand the destination, to understand what collection is and to understand 
why these lower levels are so important that you really work on the basics. Dressage is all about basics and the more solid your basics are and also the more you understand where you're headed, the better off you'll be when it comes time to get to collection. Okay, so I wanted to show you a little glimpse into the curriculum of my dressage training scale course. This course, I kind of just sent the first um, 46 students through it. So I kind of just got done making it actually. And it has over seven hours of video content. And the feedback that I've gotten from people that have taken this course is just huge because people feel like they understand a little more the framework of dressage and what they need to work on when and how to kind of take the steps needed to go forward. Some of the students in the course have trainers and some don't. So some of them are more advanced riders working on the FEI and some are beginner riders just kind of trying to get their horse going forward and on the bit. So week one, we focus on rhythm and suppleness. Each week there's lecture as well as ridden like mounted exercises. So each week I have a lecture like I'm doing here with slides. And then I have video lecture of me riding and talking through specific exercises. So week one, I have a lecture on rhythm. I have a lecture on suppleness. Then I give three groundwork exercises to work on suppleness with your horse from the ground. I talk about serpentines for suppleness, lateral and longitudinal suppleness. And then also it includes a worksheet. So these worksheets are really good to kind of print out and fill out so that you are really applying this knowledge to the specifics of your horse. Week two, we focus on connection. So again, I have a lecture on connection. I talk about doing a turn on the forehand with a side rein lunging for acceptance of the bit, and then contact. So arms, hands, and rein aids. Again, you know, when we think about rider position and how you use your arms and your hands to affect your horse. Um, okay, and then we move on to, oh, and also in connection, I do a whole video on bit and bridle fitting, which is kind of interesting because the bit that you use in your horse um, has a big impact on the connection. Connection is all about acceptance of the aids and every horse's mouth is a little different. So your horse may have a small mouth, um, they may have a very high palate, like the, the roof of their mouth may be very high, they may have a low palate. Some horses don't like pressure on their tongue, other horses don't like pressure on the bar of their mouth. So sometimes um, learning about bits and maybe tweaking a little the bit that you use on your horse can really affect the connection. Then we talk about um, impulsion. So impulsion, like I mentioned before, is a very misunderstood concept. And if you're having trouble getting your horse in front of the leg, it's probably because you don't understand the concept of impulsion and because you don't use your leg effectively. So in the impulsion week, we have an impulsion lecture. We talk about impulsion in the warm up, transitions within the gait, the effective leg. Cavaletti training is a great way to develop impulsion because impulsion is related to the amount of suspension in the horse's step. So by putting down a Cavaletti pole, you're getting more impulsion in your horse. Um, we work on lateral suppleness and how this relates to impulsion. So that's the beauty is starting to see these links in the dressage training scale, like how lateral suppleness relates to impulsion. And then let's see, what week are we on? Week three, we work on straightness. And again, I have a bunch of videos and lectures and worksheets on straightness. And then we wrap it up with collection and a few final things on week six. So that's kind of a glimpse into the training scale course. Um, 
When you click on each of those uh, videos in the training scale course, this is a little bit what it will look like. And this is actually on my cell phone. So you can download the whole course onto your cell phone and then you can watch it anywhere you are. So you can see here, there's a little description, there's a video link. Um, so I know I hate sitting at home on my computer, so I'll often like listen to it while I'm driving. Don't watch it, but you can listen to it or while you're getting tacked up or while you're waiting in line, it um, can be fully downloaded on your phone. Okay, so this is really cool. This is the final exam for my rider position course. And this is one of my students that just finished up with the course. So for the final exam, I had the students make an artistic representation of the dressage training scale something that they could post on their wall or in their tack trunk, somewhere where they'll see it. Because the dressage training scale is something that goes with you from training level all the way up to Grand Prix. It's something that you are constantly referring back to when you come across a problem or when you're warming up your horse. I think about this training scale every day, all day long, whether I'm riding a four-year-old or a Grand Prix horse. So the cool thing about this is that um, the students were able to a little bit put some images and some things to help apply specifically to their horse. So um, this particular student, she put a picture of a giraffe and a reminder to breathe in the suppleness because apparently her horse likes to go like a giraffe and stick its head up. Um, so this is just really cool. I've been blown away by these training scale representations and I encourage all of you, even if you don't take the course, to learn that dressage training scale and post it somewhere where you're gonna think about it and remember it. Um, I have, this is another one that another one of the students did. Uh, it has a bit more text in it, but again, it shows kind of all the exercises and the theory of dressage. When you're taking a dressage lesson, it's hard for the instructor to give you all of this theory and to really understand how the pieces of dressage all fit together and how you can apply them to your daily training. So this is just a great way to kind of learn the theory of dressage and then put it all together and remember to think about it when you're thinking of, okay, how can I be an effective rider? How can, and how can you teach your horse dressage when you don't yourself understand the theory and the, prog the progression of training a dressage horse? Okay, let's talk about self-carriage. So comment in the comments. I wanna hear from you guys who has felt a moment, a glimmer, anything of self-carriage. Have you ever had that feeling of where your horse is carrying themselves? Where you really feel like you're just a passenger and the horse's back is up and their neck is up. So I have Gail says yes, Carolyn says glimmer, Janet says glimmer. A couple of times, just a glimmer. <laughs> okay, Meryl says working on it. Whitney Adams says yes, it's so addictive. Okay, so self-carriage is like the epitome of an effective dressage rider. When you have been effective, you have these glimmers, these moments of where you can just sit there and you can be soft with your aids and your horse is carrying them themselves and they're doing the work for you. Like it is truly the most amazing feeling. Someone just said that it scared them at first. And it does scare you because it's so different. You almost feel this energy under you where you're kind of afraid, like maybe they're gonna like bolt or buck you off because the energy is so underneath of you and so a part of you. It's like that centaur image where you really feel like the horse's legs are your legs and you have 
this magical communication with your horse. So this idea of self-carriage where your reins can be soft, where your legs can be soft, and your horse is doing what you want without you having to tell them to do it, that is the ultimate of when you've been effective as a rider, when your aids have been effective and when you've been able to communicate to the horse what you want in such a way that they say, okay, I'll just do that on my own. So keep working towards these moments of self-carriage and I'm so glad that some of you guys have felt these moments. If you haven't felt them, keep working towards it because when you feel it, you will know. You'll be like, oh my gosh, that is what Amelia means by self-carriage. And once you felt it, it's such an addictive feeling. You might only have it for glimmers. For me, even with my Grand Prix horse, even with Harvey, you know, I have it more on my more advanced horses than on my young horses, but it's still a struggle. There's days that I'm just like, God, I, they just don't, they feel stiff and behind my leg and but you're always striving towards those moments of self-carriage and you really have to reward your horse and tell them like good that's what I want when you get those moments okay I'm really looking forward to this segment of the lecture natural horsemanship is has such a bad name so I kind of hate to even call it that but I grew up doing dressage, and then when I got my horse Geronimo, he had a horrible rearing problem. And the dressage trainers that I was with basically just beat him. They put him in long lines and left welts all over him. And Geronimo is like the most honest horse ever, like most horses are. And he was rearing because he was completely confused. He wasn't rearing because he wanted to be bad. He was rearing because me and the trainers I were working with were completely ineffective at educating him or communicating to him about what we wanted. So what natural horsemanship is, and it's really important to remember in dressage, is understanding the horse, understanding how horses think, how horses relate, and not about just um, forcing them to do things. So on the left here, we have a quote from Ray Hunt, and he says, you need to do less sooner. You're always doing too much too late. This refers to the release. So it's really important, the release, when you release the pressure. So let's say you put a canter aid on your horse. So you're trotting, you put your outside leg back, you ask your horse to canter. The instant that your horse canters, you need to release that aid. Like not totally collapse and fall apart, but you need to soften the aid so that your horse knows what you want. And as Ray Hunt says, that release has to be instant. The instant your horse does what you want, you have to release the pressure. So that's a great quote to consider when you're trying to be more effective as a rider. You have to release more. On the right here is Buck. That's a picture of Buck Branneman in the right hand photo. And he says, it's been a long time since I was afraid. Fear has to do with helplessness. The only thing that conquers it is knowledge. When you learn about how a horse thinks and make decisions, that helplessness goes away. So as you become more effective as a rider, as your position gets better, as you understand the theory of dressage, as you understand how to communicate with your horse, your fear should start to diminish. I don't know if I can read that top one. But we'll just read the bottom one. So the bottom one says there is no mysticism, no magic, or only one method in the realm of good horsemanship. It is knowing that everything you think you know about horses may change with the very next horse. So that's kind of a quote that is a little discouraging because we're trying to be effective and learn all these theories. But it's so important to know that every horse is different. 
and you have to kind of be willing to adjust to the horse and communicate to them and present a system, a theory of training that makes sense to that horse. So I hope that you guys keep in mind this idea of natural horsemanship. Ray Hunt and Bach and Tom Dorrance, they all have great books um, that you can Google and I highly recommend reading those just about how to communicate with a horse and how horses think and how horses function. I can read the first one for you. Emily. Oh, yeah, I can't see it. My goal with the horses is not to beat someone. It is to win within myself, to do the best job I can do and tomorrow to try and do better. You'll be working on yourself to accomplish this, not your horse, <laughs> Ray Hunt. Yeah, that's a great one. And I think it's really, it's sobering to realize that all the problems that you have with your horse are kind of a deeper reflection of yourself. Um, and like we talked about the rider mindset and it does, like Carolyn says in the chat, it starts with us. And so um, when we want to, you know, when we want to have a better relationship with our husbands, we have to kind of start with ourselves and looking into our soul and our actions and um, trying to improve our actions and how we are a participant in the relationship and find a way to get a different and a more effective result with our horses. Okay, so let just I wanted to kind of wrap things up and then I have time to answer a few questions from you guys. So ingredients for an effective rider. Number one is riding position. So getting in that correct position, having control of your body, taking care of your fitness and your symmetry. We all have injuries and crookednesses and you have to take care of your body. Number two, timing, balance, and feel. So timing, knowing when to apply an aid, when to release an aid, the balance of the aids you give, and then being able to feel your horse to know when to release properly. That quote again, timing, balance, and feel, I, it's a natural horsemanship quote. I think it's maybe Ray Hunt or Tom Dorrance. Three is horsemanship. So look at things from your horse's eyes. Um, understand what your horse is thinking. It's not just about forcing them and using more spore and more whip. That's not being effective, but it's trying to better communicate with your horse knowing when to be strong and when to be soft so that you can create a willing and harmonious partnership with your horse. And then number four is learn your dressage theory. So understand the system of dressage, the training scale, how the exercises all fit together, and then know where you're headed. So, you know, what is collection? How do you get there? Why do you ride shoulder in? What does a leg yield do to help your horse? And then what does it take to properly develop your horse both physically and mentally into a dressage horse? So I have time for a few questions. I'm going to, okay, let's see what people have to say. Did you guys enjoy my slides and my lecture? Okay, Lori has a question. I feel like I am, oh, it just went away. I think she said she felt like she was nagging her horse in the warm up. Um, so if you have a lazy horse that is, you feel like you are nagging all the time, the best thing to do is transitions. So transitions, transitions, transitions. If you feel like you're driving aids, your leg aids are ineffective then you need to do lots and lots of transitions to get your horse more effective. And keep in mind that idea of the boiling frog. So it's ask with like a whisper of an aid and then yell at your horse and then go back to the whisper until um, the horse listens to just that whisper of an aid. Um, Let's see, someone asked, they're enrolled in a course right now. If I can't sign up now, will the courses be available to sign up for later? Yeah, so the courses will be open again at a later time. Um, 
I'm going to be, the courses, the online courses, so if you sign up for rider position or the dressage training scale, you will be have access to some private Zoom calls with me that are only for students in those courses. I did that with the last group of people and it was really cool because everyone got to kind of know everyone else in the course and then ask questions and interact with each other on the Facebook group. So um, if you want to be a part of more private Zoom calls, I will be focusing on those courses, on the people involved in the course. Um, and yes, Meryl, when you buy a course, you do have access to it for life. So the material for the rider position and for the training scale courses, it's released every six weeks, like on a weekly basis, because there's so much information that I don't want people to try and learn it all at once or you're just gonna be overwhelmed. If you really want all the information at once, I can manually grant you access, but it's released on a six week schedule and then you have access to it forever. So you can always go back and access any of those videos, any of those worksheets. And also I have private Facebook groups that go specifically with those courses. So that's a good resource where I can help you and the other students can help you if you have questions. And then again, the more private Zoom calls where you can ask direct questions um, from me. Um, let's see, someone asked about Harvey. So yeah, that's kind of exciting news. My horse Harvey, who is eight this year, is qualified for the Developing Pre St. George Championships in Chicago, which I kind of can't believe they're having with all of the COVID. And I'm going to try really hard to go. Again, I feel a little bit like um, that poem that we go back to where it, it's out of my comfort zone. And so I'm a little bit nervous to go to a big competition like that. But it's been a dream of mine and something that I've always wanted to do. I've gotten invited before. Um, and it's always hard because I live on the West Coast in California and those championships are always on the East Coast. So it's 2000 miles away, which is very far. And so it makes it expensive and difficult to get to the show. But Harvey is one of those horses that is super special, very talented, very sensitive. And um, I'm looking forward to going. So I will be sure to keep you guys all updated with emails and videos and our Facebook group and everything else. So um, let's see. Does anyone have questions? You want to talk, Mom? Joellen? Do you have words to say? I was trying to cut and paste for you. Um, I really like the training scale class. I was like struck. I mean, I've been around Amelia all her life, right? But to hear like the whole formulation of what dressage is and how it fits together has just helped me so much. So when I ride my horse, Zephenia, you know, she breaks all the time. And even though she can get really collected and have a lot of impulsion, she doesn't have rhythm or I don't have rhythm. And so it's just been really helpful to understand more about dressage and how it all fits together. And I am stunned at how beautiful dressage is and how complicated and how clear you have to be with your body. So I appreciate your teaching for sure. <laughs> well, thank you. And I'll make sure to send you guys all um, links where you can enroll in the courses. I'll send that in an email. I'll also send the recording to this video. And I hope that you guys all got some inspiration out of this lecture. Um, I love seeing you guys. I love seeing your faces. I love reaching all of you. Um, you know, like I said, if you can't afford to do a course, I still want to help you. So I still will do my videos and my lectures and everything that I can do to help you because that's one thing that is hard about dressage is it's really exclusive and expensive. And I want everyone that wants to learn to have the opportunity to learn. So the courses are a great way if you want to kind of fast track your learning and really focus on, 
you know, either rider position or the training scale. But like I said, I'm here for you guys. So also really make sure that you're a part of my dressage club on Facebook because the support that you guys have all been giving each other is just amazing. Like people have asked questions and there's literally hundreds of comments and everyone is so supportive and kind and offering support and advice and it takes a load off of me when you guys help each other and that's really what it's all about because when you help someone else it for one it helps you because it makes you learn better the material and it also develops a community and community is so important in this sport because it's a really hard sport there's a lot of ups and downs and it's really important that we're here for each other and that you know we reach out when someone has a bad day or their horse gets hurt or their horse passes away and we need to be here to support each other in the good times and also in the bad times so thank you all for being here and I think that's it. I'll send a post post uh, lecture email to all of you. Bye everyone.